So the number one thing I want all of you to uh, remember on this is the inequality that we have in America and in much of the world is a human construct. It is something that we chose to do, whether we did it thoughtfully or by sins of omission. It exists because we adopted rules and policies that tend to redistribute upward the benefits of economic growth. We don't have to do it that way. There are other ways to do things. And it also doesn't mean if we do it another way that somehow we are punishing or stealing from people who have a lot of money. Now, let me give you a simple example of that. Uh, one of my eight grown children went to work for a startup company. She was the 15th or 17th employee. The company now has several tens of thousands of workers. She was awarded a huge number of Stock options hired about the same time. When the company finally got ready to go, pub go public, their stock options didn't vest for five years. About four and a half years had passed. And the company then laid off saying it didn't need them, almost all the employees whose number was in two digits. That is the first hundred employees, between about 10 and 100, three quarters of them were let go. And because they were let go, they didn't get anything for their stock options. That's wage theft, plain and simple. And if the law said, well, if you work for, say, four to five years and the company decided to let you go, you should get 80% of your stock options. But the law doesn't cover this at all. And the experience of this one of my grown children, who went on to be to just fine in the business world. But and many other people I've interviewed is that they get ripped off in this way. In California right now, the State Department of Employment Services, I think that's a technical name of it, the State Labor Department, is so overwhelmed by wage theft where people are made to work off the clock, to work overtime, um, that they can't even handle all the cases. And then when they do, and employers admit, oh yes, well, I cheated um, Alan Bobolsky out of uh, $20,000, then they just refuse to pay. And the state doesn't have lawyers to take them to court to get the money. And unless the individual fires a civil suit that's separate from state action, the individual can't do it either because they decide their right to care to the state. We create the structures that determine the distribution of wealth and income. And within that, how people do is, is in large part a function of, number one, their natural talents. Number two, how money motivated they are. And there are people who are highly money motivated and there are other people who they don't care. As long as they got a roof over their heads and they can uh, pay their bills, that's fine with them their propensity to save and think of the future rather than immediate gratification. And going to college is a good example of that. College degree requires a four-year multifaceted project in which you do many different things and demonstrate you can do those things and you can delay your gratification for four years when you get the degree. <clears throat> And then government policies that decide how you're taxed, how other people are taxed. And all of those things are choices that we make. So the inequality we have in America is not something that just appeared in the ethers. In the same way that, you know, things just came out of the ether, why we wouldn't have police. Do police exist in nature? No. No. We decided we need to have police, military, things like that. And so the economy you live in and the way its fruits are distributed is certainly in part the result of who worked hard, 
And who makes choices to go into fields that make money versus not making money? Who invents a better mousetrap? But mostly it's determined by government policy. And policy is heavily directed in this country by the greediest people among us. Uh, Steve Jobs and Apple provide a good example of this. When Steve Jobs and his friends invented the Apple computer, the very first one they built was in a wooden box, not the fancy aluminum cases that we get that are so beautifully designed. Literally, they were sold in wooden boxes. And um, one partner famously couldn't stand dealing with Jobs and wanted a motorcycle and he traded all his stock for $841 motorcycle. Stock that today would be worth something like $10 billion. He never sold it. When they went public, Steve Jobs' principal partner, Wozniak, said, hey, we need to give the code writers who made all this possible, the people who just lived in the office and slept on the floor next to their desk, you know, we need to give them stock. And Jobs said, why would we do that? It's my money. So Wozniak gave stock to people, but Jobs did not. Well, how different the world is if you have a system where people principally get paid in cash rather than shares of the company they're working for. What's likely to grow in value over time? The cash you got, which you might save after paying taxes on it, or if you got shares of stock on which you're not going to pay any tax until you cash them in. Again, we design a system, an economic system. It doesn't exist out in nature. Trade, tariffs, um, safety rules, investments in technology all come from choices we make. The computer that you're using is part of a very important story of taxpayer spending. According to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, more than half the growth in the American economy since World War II is the result of taxpayer spending for science, technology, engineering, and buying products. Buying things like telling IBM, if you build this big computer that we need, we promise to buy enough of them to make it worth your while, and then businesses buy mm -hmm. these computers. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, we did a lot of that, and there was an enormous amount of advancement. Databases. Oracle, the biggest database company in the world, right along with SAP, and then there are lots of other smaller ones. Oracle began as a project for the CIA, which could not keep track of all its data on its existing card system. They literally used it like you can still go to the library and go to the card catalog, even though it's now online. They just they couldn't keep track of everything. And there's reason to believe, by the way, that the original software that was the um, used to found Oracle was stolen from the Russians. A little bit of coding somewhere in there that the, the tech people who write about this stuff say has to be Russian. So it may have been a Russian individual, not in Russia, but good reason to think that perhaps it was stolen. And that company is a good example of how the government creates many fortunes. Larry Ellison, the head of Oracle for many, many years, owns 36% of the stock in that company. His dividends from that company come to $5 million a day, just from that company. And then he gets like a $40 million salary and the use of the company's jet and all these other things. If he had only been paid a wage, he wouldn't be the, what is he, the third, fourth, fifth wealthiest man in America today. So how we set up our economic system determines who benefits and who doesn't benefit. And the people who benefit the most from that system inherently, of course, want to keep their, their position. If any of you doubt that, um, keep this in mind. Um, we have had women since at least 1848 in this country at Seneca Falls trying to address male dominance of our culture and society, misogyny. 1848, have men given up their 
benefits to be equal with women. They voted to give women the right to vote. That's how women got the right to vote. But men still consider can continue as a class to exercise unrighteous dominion over women in this country. Why would you give up something you have that's a power and a privilege and benefit to you for the rest of the society? The rest of society has to make you do it. As Frederick Douglass said, I live in Rochester, Frederick Douglass is home. Uh, and I live on the street, Council Rock Avenue, where the uh, oldest democracy in the world had its annual meeting 3,000 years ago, if you believe the uh, native people. It's on a rock on my street, which is why it's called Council Rock Avenue. Um, Frederick Douglass said, Power gives nothing without demand. To think otherwise is to believe that you can have um, a lightning without thunder. So we choose these things, and we choose by how we think about them. And when people complain about a progressive tax, one of the great lies told in America is, well, you know, in the Old Testament, they had a tithe. You paid 10%. That's a lie. It's by people who haven't read their Bible. <laughs> there was a progressive tax structure in the Old Testament. It ranged from a high of about 22%. Two for the very poor, a negative tax rate of several percentage points. And if you want to read up on this, there's a professor of law at uh, in Phoenix at the Sandra Day College School at Arizona State named Adam Chodoro, C H O D O R O W, Chodoro, C H O C H O W V O R O W. I think that's right. And it's the uh, uh, he's written several pieces about the, the myth of the tithe and uh, agricultural taxes in what was an agricultural society. Um, the birth of democracy, Western democracy, in Athens 2,500 years ago, in round numbers, was a two part <clears throat> process. I call them the civil twins of the birth of democracy. One was the vote. Only male citizens could vote. And they had this elaborate system to keep people from being too clannish. There were, there were uh, 10 social clans, and they mixed them together the way the Russians did when they forced Russians to move into parts of Ukraine, and they forcibly more forced Ukrainians under Stalin to move into parts of Russia. The Athenians did the same thing. And then they changed power every uh, they had a 10-month calendar, and every month they changed who was in power to make sure that there were very conservative actions by the government. It was hard to make things happen. But to get this to happen, a question arose. Well, if the people, rather than a tyrant, a tyrant back then did not mean a horrible person, it just meant someone who seized power, who held power. If the people are going to run the government instead of tyrants, instead of the rich, how do you deal with taxes? And the solution they came up with is this. If you were lucky enough to live in Athens, you were living in a paradise compared to the rest of the world. You had art, you had culture, you had laws, you had protections against fraud, you had a military in case the Persians came again. And therefore, the greater the wealth you managed to attain because you lived in Athens, the greater your moral duty to pay back to Athens so that the society would survive. And that leads me to my next point. It is not about you. It's not about me. It's about a society. You want to have your society survive, you have to think about that society, that nation, if you wish, that religious group, whatever the, the group is. It's not about you. You may get lots of benefits from it, but it's about the culture, the nation, the tree, <clears throat> and the future, the endurance of that organization. Now, if you become a society where taxes are flat out back, French, uh, uh, France under the Louis, the French had something called the Courbet. Hey, you, 
out there, leave your farm, go dig ditches, as I tell you to do 18 hours a day for the next three months, it's your duty to the state. You don't want to do it? Okay, well, we'll kill you. That's not what we have in America. Now, how many of you know, on what number of republic do we live? The French say that they live in the fifth republic, the Germans called Nazism, the third Reich. We live in the second. Very good. I've almost never had someone say it as fast as you did. Why? What was the first American republic? The Articles of Confederacy. Okay. Confederation. Confederation. Confederacy is a little later. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Now, why did we overthrow peacefully, but why did we overthrow the Articles of Confederation government and replace it with the Constitution? It required a unanimous consent among the 13. That's not states. why we did it. That's how we did it. What's the reason we did it? Lack of taxation. Lack of taxation. The government under the Articles of Confederation lacked two crucial powers the power to tax and the power to regulate commerce. In the 60s, when I was your age, there were bumper stickers. Thomas may remember these, I know Jim does. There were people had bumper stickers during the Vietnam War, and they said, what if we funded the Pentagon by bake sale? You know, we wouldn't have all these fancy weapons, these, these you know, you look at an aircraft carrier like the Intrepid down in Manhattan, and you know, it's, it's, it isn't out there in the ocean alone. It's got about 13 submarines working around, attack submarines, and it's got um, uh, missile defense ships and destroyers, and there's a whole flotilla of about 50 ships. And it is the most expensive, most sophisticated killing machine ever designed by human beings. But that's what it is. It's a killing machine. And that costs a lot of money. The most recent aircraft carrier, which Six years after they put it in the water, it still isn't ready for duty. Cost $13.5 billion. That's just the aircraft carrier. That's not the airplanes that go on. Some of which cost $100 million an airplane. Just the ship. You can't run a government by bake sale. In fact, in 1793, the founder of modern conservatism in Europe, and Professor Kogan may differ with me, I don't know about whether he is the founder. That's always from my understanding. Uh, of modern conservatism in Europe, Edmund Burke wrote a long paper about the French Revolution. You can go on the internet and read the 1793 letter, and in it is a very important one. The revenue of the state is the state. A government is its taxes. A government with no taxes is no government at all. A government needs taxes. It needs taxes to enforce the law, enforce civil justice, operate schools, or pay for schools if it wants to outsource them to somebody else, to set up the rules and regulations that make a society work. So we live in the second American republic because we wanted to be taxed. Now, did any of you in high school who studied the American history ever get told by your teacher the reason we created the United States of America was so we could tax ourselves? Mm -hmm. How curious that nobody teaches this, and yet it's an indisputable fact. And by the way, what, 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 I'll call you a second. what led to that constitutional convention was a dispute, an unresolvable dispute between Pennsylvania and um, uh, I think it's New Jersey, but it may have been Delaware, over mud in the Delaware River. They could not resolve a disagreement because, you know, mud and sand in a river moves, right? Farm comes, whatever happens, it moves. So whose boundary is where and where do you have the authority? And when Washington and Maryland couldn't get along about this, they had a meeting on the Virginia side, and they resolved it. What to do about the Potomac River sandbars? Move. But Pennsylvania, to this day, a backward state, James Carville describes it as uh, uh, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia with Alabama in between. <laughs> um, they just couldn't come to an accommodation. And so they called this meeting in Annapolis, Maryland, to discuss the issues about the Delaware River sandbars movement. And it led to the Constitution. Now, the other element, the one I just mentioned in passing, is regulating commerce. Under the Articles of Confederation, which only lasted seven years, 
Uh, there were disputes between New York and Connecticut over furniture. New York furniture makers say, those Connecticut guys, they're stealing our business. So New York would pass some law to try and inhibit the importation. Interesting word from one state to another, the importation of furniture from Connecticut into New York and vice versa. And at least trade wars among the states. So the Constitution also provides for the regulation of commerce. Well, regulation is a form of tax. Think about it for a minute. Tax doesn't have to mean you hand over money. A tax is anything where the government intrudes into your activities. And taxes intrude. There are no two ways about it. They intrude, but there is no liberty. There is no what the Supreme Court calls ordered liberty without taxes. We all have to give up something so that we can have a society. And you're seeing that come undone right now by the laws in various states that say, you can walk down the street and go to any place you want with on a loaded AK uh, or AR-15 assault rifle. Because you have an absolute right to have a gun. I've written about this, by the way, and, and uh, what I wrote was that we're going to be absolutists about the Second Amendment. I want a personal nuclear weapon. They now make them and decide to put one in the backpack, weighs, weighs less than 50 pounds, because nobody's going to mess with me if I got a nuclear bomb in my backpack. No rights absolute. So, inequality is not per se a bad thing. Because different people have different choices and different interests. So some people really want to get rich. It's just all that matters to them. How many commas do I have in my net worth statement? It, it, they want money beyond any capacity to spend it. Uh, for years, I used to, uh, on long flights, where because I flew all the time, I got first class. I would play a little game with the person sitting next to me. I'd get out a legal pad and I said, well, let's play a game called unlimited consumption. <laughs> and here's the rule. You want to spend as much money as you can figure out how to spend. But you have to work 50 hours a week and you get two weeks vacation. And it's only money you consume. So a lot of people, when you say, well, I'm driving mansions, I say, that's not consuming. That's just turning greenbacks into houses. One of the oil paintings, same thing. You're just converting one asset into another asset. You got to spend money. Um, when I would do this with my, when I was teaching third year law students and graduate business students at um, Syracuse, um, uh, the second time I did this, I remember one of the students said, I'm going to buy all the beer that I want to have. So I got out on the chalkboard and we got people to agree how much beer could you drink in a day, what's the most expensive beer, and go to the end of the year with Buster. So the next person then said, We're, I'm going to go to dinner with friends every night at Lister. I said, have you ever been to Lister? Very famous near a restaurant. And they go there some day. And I said, okay, well, first of all, dinner is a three to four hour affair. But fine. So you know, how many friends do you can bring? What's a reasonable number? Six friends. All right, eight people. You're going to go to dinner at Lister. Let's even throw in $20,000 worth of wine for dinner. And everybody agreed to that. Go to the chalkboard and come forward. said, now there's a problem here. You have to go to work the next day and you can spend four hours eating. You think you're going to be energetic and, you know, doing well the next day? And by the way, at the end of the year, you're going to weigh 600 pounds. Your cholesterol is going to be pretty strong. Um, you can't do it with practical matter. And one young guy suggested he was going to hire very expensive mistresses. And so we went through a little calculation there and we established that he'd be dead before he could spend a big deal of money from his daughter. Um, <laughs> it's really hard to spend a great deal of money. I will say the average amount of money, though this was mostly 20 years ago, that people were able to spend was about $500,000 a year. A few people got to $800,000 to a million. My wife, the CEO of a $600 million charitable endowment, who is a super skin toy. You know, refused once to uh, put in a parking ticket after she gave a speech before she tore her hose as she walked into a store on her way back to the garage and bought hose. Therefore, it's a personal trip. I'm not going to put it into the parking. She actually figured out how to spend $5 million a year. 
She said, so I can't buy a jet. And I said, no. She said, okay, what, how about having one on hand? I said, nobody has one on hand to go to Long Snow. The standard is six hours. Okay, what's it going to cost to have my own Gulfstream ready to go on six hours of so I went and priced it out and got a hold of the Gulf Stream people. And about $2 million a year. And she wanted me to still have some of my eight children weren't grown, we had children at home. And I, she said, uh, uh, I want to have you know, a whole bunch of nannies. So we added all that up. We agreed she could have a driver waiting for any moment to go. And we got all done with it. She spent about $5 million. It's really hard to spend much more money than that. If, if, unless you want to count acquiring things that are not money, objects to art, uh, houses, things like that, farmland, that are simply trading one thing for another. How much you can consume. Spend a little time next week and just sort of imagining what would I spend if I had, I could never run out of money. What would I do? Well, one of the things my wife said was that she was going to have uh, all hooked couture soup. And I said, well, sweetheart, you work 50 hours a week. How are you going to get the time to stand there? Because they fit you and they measure you in places you don't know you have things to measure. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and said, oh, I'm going to hire a woman who has exactly my figure. And we agreed $60,000 a year to some of the dresses, which was a reasonable pay. Because you, you, know, you could say, well, I'm fair five thousand dollars a year. It would be reasonable to do it. But just think about how much you could spend. Now, Elton John spends is reportedly uh, four or five hundred thousand US dollars a year on flowers for his main home in Venice. He can be extravagant with some things like that. But uh, I assume you all know the concept of utility, since this is a philosophy course. There's no utility to having a billion dollar a year income. Larry Ellison's $1.8 billion a year just in dividends from Oracle has no utility. And yet we create systems and say, well, unless we lower taxes on people like that, they won't be productive. Now think about that for a moment. Let me use my favorite example is Jack Welch, who ran General, General Electric for 20 years. He was lionized in the business press. I was one of the very few journalists who was critical of him because I studied the finances of the company and I thought this guy is slowly ruining this company. And which, by the way, it's not just widely accepted, but he was a disaster. Now that he's been dead for a few years. And Jack Welch made roughly a little up short of a billion dollars working with General Electric. I assure you, People like him, and I've interviewed many of them, they would work just as hard for $50 million because it's the power of having the company and the power of their other people and the lifestyle and people sucking up to you, which is important as the money itself. I wrote about one company where um, they had a stock option plan for the CEO and the deputy CEO. And if they could get the stock price for a certain number of days, I think it was 60 days, to stay above a certain level, they got a huge payout in options. Uh, it worked out to be the equivalent of every single employee of the company, it's called Computer Associates, getting a bonus of $110,000. Every employee for the same amount of money would have gotten 110000 which would have made a difference in their life. Um, what I revealed was that they had not written the stock plan very carefully. They'd split the stock, but they didn't get twice as many shares because they didn't write the plan to include splits. So instead of getting as much money as they thought they were going to get, going to get half, my editor at the New York Times was like, how can you possibly know that? I said, because I read the document. Oh, that's all we have to do, read the document. Well, that's crazy. But he put it like on page C64, buried in the back of the paper. And sure enough, when litigation came, I was right. But the larger story isn't that these guys wrote a stupid plan. It's all these people worked so hard to make the company successful and the stock price to go up. And did the 33,000 employees get the benefit? No, two guys did. Right near here in New Britain. Have you ever been to New Britain? 
I encourage you to go over to New Britain. New Britain is a community where, at least the last time I was there, which was about 2004 or five, you could live in that town and only speak Polish. There's a big Polish restaurant where everything is in Polish. And it is a manufacturing town. Uh, they make wood planes and saws and hammers and things like that. That most of that work stands on China. But Stanley Works, the company that uh, that was the company town Stanley Works. Go to your parents' home. It's almost certain there's a Stanley Works tool somewhere in the, in their house. So a screwdriver, a saw, a thumb. They're ubiquitous. Um, the guy who ran Stanley Works was a acolyte of Jack Welch. There were six men who were lined up to succeed him running GE. One got the job, the other went somewhere else. And this was one of those five losers. And he got, I think it was 48% of the stock options for that company one year. It may have been a third, but I think it was 48%. And I got an interview with him. And I said, well, 33,000, 40,000, whatever it is, people work at this company. Why do you get all the stock options? They did all the work. He goes, but I got them to do the work. I got them to come to work. I got them to be productive. I, I, he literally said, I doesn't talk. And that's because the social incentives, not the legal ones, the cultural incentives, say, you can do that. You're a great hero. What a strange society. In fact, I've sat and talked to blue collar workers who brag about how much money their boss makes, even if they write that the company wants them to pay more out of pocket for their health care and wants to get rid of their pension. Now, Adam Smith explained this to us in his first book. He wrote two books. They're both still in print more than 240 years later. The first book, written in 1755, was The Theory of Our Moral Sentiment. At least that's the shorthand for it. The other one is the Walton book. And he revised that book, I believe there were nine editions. He kept changing as he got older. And, and Adam Smith was the, the Scottish professor who was just the classic, iconic image of the absent minded professor. Literally who he was. He would just be thinking thoughts and walk down the street until he didn't realize where he was. And in it, he wrote, and I'm paraphrasing, because his writing is, is elegant on this point. Um, that is, it seems to be the nature and disposition of people to look up to and admire the rich. Well, to turn away from those of mean condition, meaning the poor, that was a turn of time. Your life was mean. Uh, and this is the, the great challenge to our moral sentiment. As, as however we have been put together by nature, we seem as a species to have this tendency to look up to and admire people because they have money. Well, money's nice. I mean, I've, I've gone from being a kid who grew up in a house where sometimes we went two weeks without electricity because we didn't have any money to being a moderately wealthy man. I, I have more than enough money for the rest of my life, even if I live to be 100, which is not like that. I don't have any against being wealthy. But to what end? And what about the distribution of that wealth? How much crime do we have in pathological behavior and use of methamphetamines and opioids because people don't have enough money and the society has more than enough? In the 1800s, Henry George came out of nowhere as a social reformer. He developed an idea that we should only tax land. Don't tax buildings, just tax land. That way you won't have like vacant parking lots in downtown. You won't have misuse of land. People will move the land to the highest and best use. And he wrote a book, Progress and Poverty. His focus was on how is it that we're creating wealth and want at the same time? Wealth goes up and want goes up. Have you ever seen a flock of geese, a few of which were fatted and the rest skin and bone? He asked. Or a herd of buffalo the same way? Animals in nature, subhuman animals, don't behave that way. 
In fact, many animal species do things like share food if there's a shortage of food. Um, uh, when whales are migrating, the oldest member of the whale group will often fall back and let the killer whales eat them so that the rest of the herd can go on and can protect the little ones so the species will endure. Altruistic behavior. Cooperation and altruistic behavior are fundamental to wealth building. But what's the point of creating wealth if a handful of people get all the wealth and other people have trouble just eating enough? In Rochester, New York, where I live, in 1967, Business Week did a cover story, The Richest City in America. And probably what? Uh, Kodak, a company that for 100 years had profit margins off the chart because of all the advances in photography had made, especially color photography. Xerox, which was in the same business, images, just photocopies instead of photographs, uh, was based there. Uh, Bouton Long, French's Mustard, uh, a lot of clothing companies, Western Union, Railway Signal, which made possible for railroads to operate by saying uh, and moving uh, track equipment and stuff. Many other companies. Rochester, New York, for 100 years was Route 128, Silicon Valley, and Seattle, all wrapped into one in the analog age, the industrial age. It was incredibly well. In 2013, my wife had a report written from the official government data. Every sixth person, 16% of the population, every sixth person in the city of Rochester lived on less than half the poverty threshold, that is the threshold for getting out of poverty. The official government threshold at the time, half of it was $12,000, $1,000 a month for a family of four. $12,000 a month for a family of four. It's currently about uh, $13,000 or $14,000 for a family of four. How could that be? By the way, there were more poor people in combined in the suburbs and the rural areas than in cities. But how can that be? Well, let's see. Taxpayer dollars were spent, millions and millions of dollars, to take good paying factory and other jobs and give subsidies to companies to move out to the suburbs where almost everybody's white. The bus system was designed to make sure that you couldn't work out there and live in the city. You can only get around the city. They dug something called the inner loop, a freeway that was below ground level around the whole downtown. Why? Got rid of the prosperous black neighborhood. And by the way, this went all over the country. All over the country. People who were prosperous and black, in some cases prosperous and brown, uh, the government found reasons to tear up their homes. And the Constitution of the United States, the document that defines the Second American Republic, says that the government can't take your property without just compensation. Well, just compensation in the real world is typically 15 to 25 cents on the dollar. So if you have a $100,000 house and you paid it off, you'd probably get 15 to 25,000 dollars for it. There's a great lawsuit that I wrote about in one of my books about how George W. Bush and his buddies used the government's power of eminent domain to take property to build a stadium for the uh, Texas Rangers baseball team, which he owned a big portion of. And one family, a wealthy family, sued. And I spent several weeks in Texas sitting in a Waco, Texas, former little store that had been turned into just file state for a law firm, reading the documents in this case. And, you know, the government says eminent domain, unless you got a lot of money to fight, you're going to get 15 to 25 cents on the dollar. You won't get your real money. And who are the people mostly affected by this? The Rangers case happened to involve generally well-to-do people, but usually it's marginal people. Sometimes it's people who started out marginal, and over time, because they held on to land and buildings, they became wealthy. 
then the government comes and takes most of it away. Now, it's legal. It's what I call legal theft. And who benefits from that? Well, the people who built the new business. They got the land for next to nothing. Walmart, always low prices, right? That's their motto. Well, almost 90% of Walmart distribution centers, and if you're a Walmart, you got to have lots of logistical centers around the country. These warehouses to bring stuff and then send out what you need to this and that store because they got thousands of stores. Almost 90% of Walmart distribution centers were built with your tax dollars. About a third of Walmart stores were built with your tax dollars. And how do they do that? Well, I, uh, I'm Walmart. I want to build a Walmart on this piece of land that Professor Pogge owns where his house is. And it's just perfect in my view for a Walmart. So I go to the government of New Haven and say, I need to condemn that land. It's, uh, uh, it's derelict property. They take the land from Professor Pogge. And then I say, now, I want you to build me a Walmart store. And here's the specification. So many acres of asphalt. Because a Walmart, like a grocery store, is basically an island of concrete with an inexpensive frame building surrounded by an ocean of asphalt. And you bring up the stuff you're going to sell in the back with 18 wheelers, and you sell it out the front door by the paper bag, and you profit off the difference between buying things and truck price and selling in the paper bag price. And then I want you to lease me this building. And how are we going to pay that? How are we going to pay for the building? Well, you're going to sell bonds. And the bonds will be secured by the sales taxes on everything people buy from me at the Walmart store. And so the store doesn't cost me anything. Who does it cost? Well, it costs the local fire department, police department, school, library, parks, everybody who depends on property tax revenue or sales tax revenue, sales tax revenue and property tax revenue because the government owns the building. That's who's paying the price of it, but it's not obvious. And who gets rich off this? The Walmart family and people who bought stock in their company. It's a government system to take from the many and give to the few. And then, by the way, I will tell all the local news organizations, we're going to create 224 jobs. Well, it'd take a lot of work for the journalists, if they had the skill to do it, to go and prove that, well, that's true, but you're going to replace a whole bunch of mom and pop businesses. And they had 400 jobs. You really are destroying 160 jobs to create these 240, not to mention wiping out these small capitals, these burgers with an H, B U R G H E R, these burgers who were making a good living and building up their wealth as little guys. So when you look around, I want you to keep this in mind. It is a normal, natural thing as you grow up, as you're born and you grow up, to look around and say, oh, this is the way the world is. Okay. But the question to ask is, how did we get there? Why did we get there? And is that where we want to be? And creating a different society doesn't mean that you have to come to me, the guy who's a Walton family member, and say, we're going to take your billions of dollars. You don't have to do that. <clears throat> you can just set up rules that don't take away the businesses of small people, not because you beat them in the marketplace, but because the government gave you a leg up, gave Walmart a leg up. And you have to have the civil twin that led to the creation of democracy in ancient Athens, progressive taxes, the Old Testament had, progressive taxes. The greater the gain you managed to achieve because you live in Athens, the greater your obligation to pay back to Athens so that Athens will endure, the society will endure. And if you do that, then you create social stability. You know, people who are well-fed and well-housed and, and don't live in, in economic terror, they're not likely to start a revolution. 
they could become sulfified. One of the things I remember in one of the philosophy courses I took in college was the professor saying, well, keep this in mind. Someone was complaining about all the wars involved in the Italian peninsula. Popes who were warrior popes who literally went to battle and whatnot. And, uh, and uh, someone pointed out that the well, Swiss were not involved in any wars. He said, well, that's true. Thousands of years of Italian warfare had given us opera and Michael D'Angelo Sistine Chapel. And the Swiss had given us bank secrecy and the cuckoo clock. You know, you solve one problem, you create others. You have to think about that. But we don't have to have a grossly unjust society in which the many are taxed and burdened to add to the riches of the poor to a level at which there is no utility to their wealth. So that's like, that's my spiel. I want to give you guys lots of time to ask questions. So. Uh, Carson. No. No. Okay. What's your name? Avery. Avery. What's your last first last? Lenahan. Lenahan. Oh, from Ireland. Yes. Lenahan. Yes. Yes. Irish. Oh, uh, very Irish. Um. So I was wondering, do you think that good financial education will ever be able to bridge the gap, or like, to what extent do you think teaching people of lower socioeconomic status how to wisely spend money will alleviate the problem? You know, I, I think you hit upon one of the most interesting questions that I don't have an answer to. <laughs> but let me point out that in China, people say it heavily. Even poor people say it. Okay? And in America, poor people generally don't say it. So it suggests to me that there's a cultural component to this, a critical cultural component about saving. And uh, yes, I think we can encourage people to save more. We can figure out how to do that, but people have to have this delayed gratification and they have to have a belief that somehow this is useful in the future. Uh, one of my other children, who's an artist and a writer and a photographer, she has an MFA, um, worked in a factory and they uh, offered uh, one day a 401k plan and nobody was signing up. So she worked up a spreadsheet and a little paper and when all the guys were at lunch, and most of the guys who worked in this factory had been in the joint. Um, a lot of them didn't have a high school diploma. She pointed out that if you just saved the 3%, that got you a 4.5% match from the company, 7.5%. And just had them put it in the Vanguard 500, by the time you were retirement age, you'd have all this money, and you'd be well off. And the very first guy said, I'll leave out the numerous uh, four letter words and 13 letter words in his response. <laughs> it basically said, What makes you think I'm going to be alive when I'm 65? And I'd rather have a beer Saturday night than worry about what's going to happen when I'm 65. So part of, part of it is you certainly have to have people think about the future and think about the downside. Uh, there's a poverty exercise. If any of you get a chance to do it, I recommend you do. Um, We've done it in Rochester and Syracuse and other places where people come with expert at this. And you are given a card that says, well, I'm a this and I have this much income and this is happening. And you have to go around and try to figure out how to navigate the system. So you got to get health care for your kids. Uh, your husband just walked out on you or your car broke down or your employer cut your hours. And you have to go from death to death. And, and there's no way you can possibly make ends meet. And we know that this has very serious negative effects on children in terms of their mental and emotional health and even their physical growth and their life things. Poor people don't live as long. So yeah, I think we can get people to save more, but financial education as it's promoted in this country, and I was writing about financial education stories in the 70s, I don't see them having any success. Mm -hmm. They're just technical things about um, why you want to save an IRA or 401k or buy the Vanguard 500. They're not about you and your relationship to money and why you need to think not just about these imaginary riches, but downside. And what do you do if the transmission falls out of your car and get your work? Um, what's your name? Oh. 
Alex, you wrote a paper. I did. I'm, uh, you and Justin, who's Justin? Really, I'm, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Go ahead. I had a question that actually wasn't on the paper. It's a new question I thought of based on what you said. We were talking a lot about I mean, if I'm in and government subsidies and all these tax loopholes, obviously, you're going to talk about. One thing that I you haven't mentioned is seniorage, inflation, in other words, yeah. the impact of inflation, particularly the inflation that we're seeing now on you know poor working class Americans who earn cash, like you did say, right. you're, earning, you're in cash, inflation affects that. Whereas if you're in stock options that grow, or even mansions, real estate, which is growing hugely right now, but up until very, very recently, um, has, has grown enormously over the last year. If you own even oil paintings, which are constantly growing value, particularly after the so far. so far, so far. But um, if you get paid in cash and you don't invest that or you invest that as an amateur, yeah. you don't have wealth managers doing that for you, you are losing right now 9% a year yeah. and probably more in the future. So that is, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that as a okay. government so, solution from the shoulder? Inflation is a very complicated phenomenon. From an economics point of view, most of my studies were in economics. Or economics and then regulation. Um, right now, there's inflation all over the world, and we're actually one of the countries with the lowest inflation. And why are we having inflation? Oh, that's really easy. One person, Vladimir Putin. And that's the reason it's so bad. Um, there's going to be probably mass starvation in Africa this year. Or next year, uh, and the Middle East, because uh, Ukraine has not been able to uh, plant as much corn and uh, I'm sorry, uh, wheat and winter wheat, which gets planted about now and it comes up in spring. That's a very important crop, and the Russians aren't letting the uh, Ukrainians on worm while they got run off ship this food out. And then energy. When you, anything you buy the food, two thirds of the value of what you bought is energy. Uh, fertilizers you use uh, uh, stored sunlight. That's what, that's what barrel oil or, or natural gas or, or coal is. It's just half sunlight that's been stored. And transporting it. So fertilizing it, putting it in the ground, harvesting it, getting rid of the weeds, uh, uh, bringing it to market, processing it, shipping it, Keeping it cold if it needs to be, about two thirds of everything you spend on food is energy. And if energy supplies are constricted, then you're going to have inflation. Um, we've had long periods in the world of no inflation. We've had periods of 100 years of falling prices. And falling prices, a deflation, are vastly worse than inflation because. Why would you spend any of your money? And just imagine what would happen if everybody in America literally taxed their paycheck one week and took it home and put it in the pocket. <clears throat> my income is your spending. Your spending is my income, vice versa. It, it is, it, it, this is a symbiotic system. This is the great insight of Adam, one of the great insights of Adam Smith, who started out studying the flow of blood in the human body. If your venal and arterial blood flows don't match perfectly, blood begins to pool somewhere in your body, probably where you're sitting. And if you don't cure it, what happens eventually? It rots and it kills you. So we need to understand that we're all interdependent. There's a really good lesson about this in the little light romantic comedy called um, The Prince and Me about it. Uh, Wisconsin uh, farm and a young woman is going to college and meets this guy who turns out to be Cognito, the uh, crown prince of Denmark. And and it, it, it shows up twice in the movie. It's a great little economic lesson. And it's a nice little movie uh, with Julius Stiles. Um, so inflation actually tends to benefit the best off, provided they're not leveraged. Very wealthy people who decide to leverage up, that is, they borrow a whole bunch of money, they often get killed in inflation because they bought property at a 4% mortgage and now they've got to refinance at six and a half and they lose their property. Um, 
Uh, but I don't think multi inflation is politically driven. I think it's driven by economic forces. And there's billions of fact points out there. One of the things in economic school that drove me crazy, particularly when I was at the University of Chicago, where I arrived, these people have figured it all out and I left going, these people are crazy. Because <laughs> they have beautiful algebra, but they know nothing of human behavior. <laughs> is that uh, you'll see this in economics papers. All else being equal. Well, when is all else ever equal? <laughs> you know, all else being equal, um, X would happen. But that's not how the world works. They're models. They're not the real world. That, and I don't mean to all suggest we shouldn't be concerned about inflation. She's very concerned about it, and it's effect on people at the very bottom. <clears throat> you're seeing this going to play out in an interesting way in Britain. The price of home energy, uh, heating your home and lighting your home in Britain has just been raised 80% because of food. There's a new Tory government. Um, now the new person who's come in, Liz Trust, is not the total clown that her predecessor was, uh, but she's a Tory. And the conservatives are not going to go help working people. That's not their constituency. Uh, and it's not their ideology. So we're interested to see what happens uh, as people uh, fight this. But there isn't a lot you can do about it except uh, limit people's ability to spend. So if you want to uh, lower inflation, that's why you raise interest rates. But you can also do things like um, uh, you know, work on uh, areas of consumption that are not productive to society. Try and tamp those down. And it, just on a side point, I'll, I'll take your question. Um, crime has been falling in this country for 100 years. The level of crime today compared to the 1980s is way, way, way down, even though uh, you would think otherwise because one of the cheapest, easiest things for TV news to do is to cover fires and murders. <laughs> so people have a very disproportionate view of crime. There's a number of well-done studies about this very point. Well, sometimes you need to stimulate economic activity. So I wrote a satirical piece once suggesting that here's the way to do it. We assign, you know, because in, in crime statistics, the theft of the tricycle and a murder count the same, one. They each count as one. So what do you say we assign everybody a numerical value, $5 million for me? If you can kill me and get away with it without the police catching you for five years, you get $5 million tax-free from the government, which would certainly stimulate a lot of economic activity. First of all, people spending money and plotting how to kill other people and then all the money we would demand be spent to hire more cops to do detective work to catch these people, both to stop the killings and also to see to it that uh, we don't pay out the $5 million bounty. So think about the fact that we sometimes we need to stimulate the economy. That's what we saw go on during the pandemic, where child poverty just fell away in the last six months of 2020. Just why? Well, because we sent everybody with a kid $250 or $300 a month, depending on the age of the kid. And that's all it took to have a huge beneficial effect. And by the way, every other country, modern, modern country, every other modern country, they do that. They, one way or another, they subsidize having children. Only in America do we say, well, tough luck, you're on your own. Oh, and by the way, didn't mean to get pregnant, can't have an abortion in half the state. Uh, you are Justin. Justin, that's right. Uh -huh. So I had so I appreciated your comment on the mom and pop shops and you're kind of or I mean I, I too have like a hatred towards like Walmart, Amazon, even Oh, like, I don't hate Walmart or Amazon, I just don't shop there. I <laughs> well I, I do shop there. And so a, a kind of the question I have like in this age of like these big businesses being really great at efficiency and expanding, how do we promote mom and pop shops and then Okay, is that yeah, a good thing for me. Okay, so first of all, inefficiency creates jobs. If you could go back in time to the year 1500, 
with a uh, Glock pistol and unlimited ammunition, you'd be the most powerful person on the planet, right? Um, you can now buy a handgun on the street for 25 bucks. I mean, a crappy little handgun that may not kill off when you want, and, and may not kill the person you want to kill, but you can buy a gun for 25 bucks. You can buy a very good gun for $100. And as manufacturing becomes more efficient, it creates fewer jobs. So when I was uh, 18 years old, I'm a reporter for a new business and for a little weekly newspaper, some high school and reporting for this paper. Um, I went to a lumber mill and I was terrified. There were these big saws that would just you know chew you up in a second, and there were these redwood trees that were you know the big around at this table, and it was boom, 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 cutting slices out of them. And there were hundreds of men working there, hundreds of them. So I tried to get into a sawmill in Coos Bay, Oregon, eight years ago. It processes as much lumber as the giant lumber mill there did when I thought in 1976. It has a total staff of eight, and that includes the office staff. Trucks pull up, they um, lift up, <clears throat> uh, and the, the logs go this way, and computers take over. And they measure each tree and they determine the best way to cut it to get the maximum board feet of lumber out of it. And they line them up and they cut it all up and then the computer robot stacks it. Eight feet from the, you know, the, the front office set. There's no job. Manufacturing, as it becomes more efficient, means fewer jobs. Smaller is good. And manufacturing is a smaller and smaller and smaller section of our economy. On the other hand, the jobs that are in manufacturing are going from being the uneducated guys who work in sawmills to really skilled people. And Walmart, by the way, I have some friends who are executives at Walmart. Walmart treats its managers and executives really well. It's the commodity people on the floor who get minimum wage, they treat that. Um, they also have a system, by the way, to guarantee male supremacy. There's a book coming out about this by two professors who are friends of mine who've been writing about uh, marriage in America and family stability. And their principal finding is that conservatives always say marriage builds stronger families that are well, that are financially better off. And what they've shown is definitively is no, being financially better off builds better families. It's the other way around. It's not fighting about money all the time and, and inability to, to take care of yourself. And uh, because of the lawsuit, they have all this inside information about Walmart. How does Walmart have so few women executives? Well, you want to become a manager to Walmart, you have to agree when they ask that you will move anywhere in the country. So if you're a man, you can do that. Especially if you're the sole breadwinner. You can say, all right, well, sweetie, taking the kids and we're going to middle of nowhere, Texas. But we're going to start making $120,000 a year instead of saying but a lot of women can't do that. They have kids and they're the sole breadwinner, or they're the secondary breadwinner. And in fact, the documents show that Walmart knows this. They know perfectly well what they're doing. So structural items that tend to keep women's incomes down in Walmart and men's incomes go up. So um, there's nothing wrong with efficiency. Um, Years ago, the last surviving Ronald Reagan economics advisor and I were on a panel in Washington, 20 years ago. And I was arguing for universal, no out-of-pocket health care. Uh, it was Donald Trump's argument for me at the time. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Donald and I are deeply involved in this for 30, 40 years. He said he hates me more than any other journalist in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and Donald's position was health care should be like a road. When you need it, you just use it. You don't pay anything out of pocket for it. It's just there and you use it. Well, I was arguing for universal no out of pocket health care. And Reagan's guy turns to me and says, Oh, so you want to put thousands and thousands of inner city, black is the code word here, inner city women who process health insurance forms out of work. That's who you are. You want to put all those women out of work. And I looked at him and said, Absolutely, I want to put every one of them out of work. We'll find a new job. That's another problem we have to solve. 
But I said, listen, if, if you want to do paperwork to create jobs, if that's your goal, if you think the way to create a sound economy is make work, I have much better suggestion than what you're thinking about with insurance paperwork, which trust me, when, when you're out there in the world and you're on your own and have a family, insurance paperwork will drive you crazy. <laughs> um, I said, I have a much better solution. I want to ban all earth moving equipment. You want to build a building? You hire men with shovels and women with shovels. Oh, by the way, if that doesn't create enough jobs, well, then we'll go to Democrat phone. That's great jobs. I never ever argue against efficiency. Efficiency is a good thing. So, your hand up? Your thumb? Yeah. No, you're just flexing your fingers. Yeah. Who else? Um, Women? Yeah. What's your name? Uh, Marisol. Marisol. Spell it. M A R I S O L. M A R I S O L. Oh, Marisol. Yeah. Would you say, how do you pronounce it? Marisol. My soul. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 by the way, it's important to pay attention to people's names and respect their name. Okay. Uh, journalists always should ask people, how do you spell your name? I once got a woman's name wrong on the front page of the LA Times. My boss was curious. She actually misspelled her name to me. <laughs> your name, but some people will give you their wrong age. And you ask them, but ask people how to pronounce their name. And at my age, I have a little trouble sometimes hearing and then mispronouncing names. So I'm, I apologize for my shortcoming. That's <laughs> all. What, uh, what's your question? Um, okay, so I I really appreciated your point on like basically the non-existent utility of additional like, wealth and income. At some point. Yes. Um, and I think like I, I agree with that. Um, but I have a question about like the the public good that can actually come from people with like massive incomes and massive wealth stocks in investing it in like municipal bonds or mortgage backed securities, that kind of thing. Okay. Is there like a way to, you know, achieve the public good that comes from those securities, you know, without having that like minor like massive finance? Okay. I'm gonna quarrel with your question a bit. Okay. There's always a way to do something. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think the question I want to ask is what is the optimal way to put uh, non utilitary uh, bodies of uh, 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 groups of wealth to use to some useful purpose. So let's start with what most of it is right now it's in the secondary investment market. Um, every week I buy shares of mutual funds. I'm not launching a company, I'm not creating jobs, I'm buying a ride from the stock market. Or in the bond market, if I buy, I buy bonds every week. Um, but I'm not creating any jobs in that. Okay. Now, what about investing in new enterprises? Risky business. That's why we seek very high returns to offset the risk. Um, yeah, we have, we have incentives to encourage that. Um, buying municipal bonds. Well, it would depend mm -hmm. on. What you use municipal bonds for? Um, a baseball stadium, or the ticket, or a football stadium. Football stadium, a better example. Anybody know what the average price of a football ticket is in an NFL game? Just an ordinary, you know, the average of all tickets, about five hundred dollars. Which state, ticket. Which state like, uses municipal bonds? Anywhere in the country. Oh, all the football, baseball stadiums, they're not built by the they're built by taxpayers. They're gifts. It's the, 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 the whole sports industry is based on taxpayer gifts. But the average ticket to an NFL game this year is around $500. Okay? Um, more, it's why more and more and more tickets to sporting events are not being bought by individuals who, the $500 ticket, you have to earn about $750 paid taxes and then you have the $500 left. But if you are a business and you buy it, it's $500. It's tax deduction, so it saves you. $200 in taxes, and it really only cost you $300. Um, I'm not sure that's a particularly productive use, but I accept the fact that, well, I don't care about sports, many people passionately do, and they're willing to be taxed for it. Um, what about using bonds to get rid of potholes in our streets? If you go to Stockholm, you'll see that there are no potholes in the streets. My wife and I spent several days when I was working on a book 
in Stockholm trying to find a pothole. We went to City Hall, we stopped bus drivers, police officers, and we only had a couple of people laugh at us. That there are no potholes in Stockholm because uh, they build the roads so they don't have potholes. And here we have a different system. We keep building crappy roads and then we rebuild them because it creates jobs, just like paperwork for insurance forms. Um, well, if we're going to build roads that don't have potholes, um, yeah, that's probably be a pretty good idea. Um, but I think a, a, a better way to look at that is what if we actually have people with that kind of income pay taxes on a progressive basis? Our tax system in America is progressive and you should pay more as your income rises until you get to around $2 million and certainly around eight, and then it begins to fall off. And we tax workers much more heavily than we do capital. Conservatives will tell you anything you tax more of, you'll get less of it. That's why I think we should tax carbon heavily. You want to get people to stop driving gasoline cars and you know, doing other things that are contributing to climate disruption. A good phrase to use, climate disruption. But a heavy tax on carbon. I'm going to put a progressive tax on carbon. People will find out real efficient ways. You'll get 50 miles per gallon, 50 miles per gallon cars, you'll see. Um, innovation, better ways to get around, more public transportation. Um, but there is an unlimited need for public infrastructure, public furniture. Um, and we can find ways to finance that that make us all better off and to put to work money like that. Instead, what happens is during your lifetime, there's limits to how much you can dump in your tax return to charitable mm -hmm. gifts. Um, right now, if you don't have a mortgage and you're a married couple, uh, if you give away $25,000, only um, uh, $14,000 or $15,000 of that is tax deductible because of the way the tax system works. But if you die and leave $10 billion, you can give all the charity the government never gets to die. And it might be a charity that just helps you know, Yale, where already you've got a very well-to-do or will be well-to-do in the future group. It doesn't help people who go to, you know, East, um, a horrible place to live, Iowa, college. Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of things we can do. I don't know if that's necessarily the way to do it. Um, I'm more concerned that people pay the taxes based on their income in a truly progressive fashion. Uh, uh, my next book, by the way, is a whole new federal tax system. It's been gone over by tax accountants, tax administrators, tax lawyers, business owners. Nobody can find a flaw in it. Uh, they all say that the wealthiest people in America and the Wall Street Journal and the federal state will immediately set out to kill it, mm -hmm. uh, even though it would make the country wealthier and more socially stable and, and have less make work because. The reality is lots of wealthy people make money off the tax code. I once proposed a forum in Washington to the head of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I said that we were discussing tax policy. And I said, okay, here's the policy for you. The federal corporate income tax is hereby repealed. Are you in favor or against it? Well, he said, I have to see the proposal. I said, I just gave you the proposal. New section of the tax code. The federal corporate income tax is hereby repealed. Well, I don't know if we're against that or in favor of it. And we were hanging out with tax for some time about this. And I finally said to the other people in the room, the reason the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is having trouble with this is they all know the truth of the following. Many of the biggest corporations in America literally turn the burden of corporate income tax into a profit center. And after I had reported that in the New York Times and called a liar by all sorts of people, Congress did a study, 1,800 page, three volume study and prove that, in fact, there are companies that stamp their tax documents in the profit center. <laughs> and it's just one of those things that we want you to understand the tax system so obvious. By the way, how do you do that? So tomorrow, on Maristol, you get a phone call saying, Uncle Hector, you've never heard of, just left you a billion dollars. As soon as you get over the joy, I suspect you're going to run to a tax lawyer and say, what do I do? And the tax lawyer is going to say, well, you're never going to have to pay taxes again if you follow my advice. 
You're going to borrow against your billion dollars. You're never going to sell any stock. You're just going to borrow against it. And you'll pay two. Well, right now you pay 4%. Six months ago, you would have paid 2%. But the lowest tax rate you would pay is 20. So your borrowing can never equal the taxes you would have paid. And you're going to get richer and richer and richer and borrow more and more and more money. And you're going to die vastly richer than you were after spending a lot of money. And who pays for that? The rest of us. So I know I didn't give you a very good answer. Sorry about that. Well, I just hope that happens to me now. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the odds are roughly equal to sun rising in the West. Too bad. <laughs> okay. So kind of going off of um, what you were saying about uh, reduced utility after a certain income, similar to rental. Um, so if I believe, or yeah, I believe that the United States is one of the most philanthropic nations as well. A lot of it thanks to these billionaires like Bill Gates. So I was wondering what you think the progressive income tax would do to the philanthropic efforts, if anything, like would it discourage it? Yeah. Or, yeah. Got it. Well, first of all, we're not necessarily more philanthropic. In Muslim countries, you're expected to give two and a half percent to the Um The um, in the U.S., we give about two percent consistently. But we do have a whole industry. My wife is a big part of it, focused on prosperous to wealthy, to super wealthy people. Um, the most generous people in America, by the way, who give, they give twice the rate of Americans as a whole are the poor. But it is like most giving self-interested. They give to their church, which is really their social life. So in Los Angeles, you will see people give a lot of money to the uh, music center, the whole big complex of theaters and um, ballet, um, orchestra, et cetera, in downtown LA. Uh, but it's also where these people build their social life. Most giving has a strong element of self-interest. Um, the um, I think we could encourage more giving through some very minor changes in tax law. My wife and I only give every five years because of the change in tax law that Republicans made. So when the Republicans changed the tax law so that our gifts would no longer be deductible in 19, 2017, you went out more $150,000 made a charitable contribution in December, paid the money off in the next couple of months, uh, and got a huge tax deduction that was just a small interest offset. We haven't made a charitable gift since then. We'll make another big gift this year. In this case, we don't have to borrow money, but we'll make a big gift, and then we probably won't give again maybe for the rest of our lives. And the money went into something called the donor advice fund. It's like an uh, ordinary people's private foundation. We get to say this is where we'd like the money to go. And we could encourage a lot more giving that something called an important phrase, permanent <clears throat> charitable capital. There's a terrible shortage in the country of permanent charitable capital. And there's a huge assault on permanent charitable capital given by the middle class and the group I'm in the upper middle class by super wealthy people. And the Wall Street Journal done many pieces about it at the time. Who's on a few? This is a horrible abuse. And yet, none of these people are proposing taking away the kind of giving that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are doing. Uh, just people like you're going to be after you get out of here and start to make a lot of money. Um, I also think we should probably have some incentives to give the things that are totally not self-interested. So uh, I'm a graduate, I'm, not, I'm making this up. I'm a graduate of Harvard, I give money to Harvard, they do say nice things about me and do various things, but if one of my kids is an idiot in the school, okay? <laughs> Legacy. But maybe I should get a bigger tax deduction for giving to Berea College. Which is a poor people's college in Kentucky where there is no tuition. Maybe if I got just a one percentage point larger deduction for giving to Berea, I actually think maybe we should look at something the ancient Greeks did. Uh, the ancient Greeks, when they started their progressive tax system, um, they didn't have the accounting systems we have and all the knowledge we have about finance. So 
every time they had to have a public festival, there were lots of these religious public festivals, or they had to build a new warship called the Trireme, they would uh, say, Mr. Pogi, you're the next wealthiest person on our list. You have to pay for the festival of the water. And you would say, wait a minute, I'm not the next wealthiest person. Justin is. And Justin could say to you, well, I'll tell you what. We'll swap fortunes. That's a kind of audit. Because if, in fact, Justin is wealthier than you, which he said is true, then you want to swap fortunes with him. But if he's really only posing like Donald Trump is about the size of his wealth, and he's wealthy, but he's not a billionaire, and you swap money with him, you end up worse off. It's called um, um, antidosis, A-N-T-I-D-O-S-I-S. It's a, a prototype of audit to put integrity into the system. Um, We, we, it would be a good thing to have more charitable giving, but the places where we need charitable giving are not where a lot of the money is going. That's one of the great things about Bill Gates, he's been giving money for public health. I wrote a column years ago that I know he read suggesting we should spend his money to create Gates University. Total merit, no tuition, students get paid to come to school. You don't perform, we throw you out, you do perform. You know, here's your room, board, we'll be spending money. You got to study like crazy. I'd like to see some of those where strivers can get the kind of education they're not getting today. And I think we could, with some minor tweaks in the tax code, encourage something like that. I also know that I, I can tell you right now that we said, well, you get one percentage point larger tax deduction if you give to a place like Korea, that the Wall Street Journal editorial page would be all over this. It's a communist block. It's a socialism. It's anti American. The republic will fall. Mm -hmm. so, you take a question from Jim? Yeah, I'll okay. Go for it. You got your hand up, so we assume there's a question. Yeah, I wanted to uh, say great, uh, great presentation, and also and uh, um, ask you to talk a little bit about. Uh, our previous president, uh, because you're you published a lot of books about Donald Trump. Um, there is a new case uh, that the Attorney General of New York has filed uh, involving a civil lawsuit. I got it, Jim. Uh, we spoke out, but I'll do it, okay? Sorry? Um, I said I'll do it, but let me do it. I got your point. Okay. Yeah. I just want you to uh, okay. so, address no, I, 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 where I'm we sorry. are there. I've so, written three best selling books about him, two of them are international bestsellers. Donald Trump is the third generation head of a four generation crime family. They're a white collar crime family. Uh, in the past, they ran whorehouses, um, uh, built buildings on property they didn't own. Uh, Donald's father ripped off taxpayers and uh, uh, tenants in his buildings. And Donald is just one criminal scheme after another in full life. Cheating workers, cheating vendors, cheating suppliers, literally cheating players at one of his casinos that they nailed him for, and soliciting 12, 13, and 14 year old gamblers who were given liquor, limousine, hotel suites, um, and minimal punishment by the state of New Jersey today. And there's not a charitable bone in Donald's body. Um, he is a top to bottom fraud. He literally doesn't know anything. When he arrived at the USS Arizona Memorial, his chief of staff, General Kelly, had to explain to him what Pearl Harbor Day was. He thought Finland was part of Russia. He doesn't know Baltic from Balkan. And most important of all, he doesn't know a Sunni from a Shia. And I don't expect you to need to know that, or I can tell some of you do know there's from a Sunni and Shia. But if you're the president of the United States, you damn well better understand very deeply a Sunni from a Shia from a Wahhabist. And he has no idea. And he's a deeply disturbed uh, person. Um, DC Report, where Jim was our investigative economics writer, uh, for a long time was the only place that would publish a now 
inspired Yale professor named Bandy Lee, a professor of psychiatry, who was going to say in technical terms what everybody around Donald has known for years, which in the vernacular is he's crazy at our age. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, his Trump University was uh, funded by people making legal kickbacks. In he had a TV show on NBC, so NBC gave him money. He did business deals with the wrestling federation, you know, the Sony wrestling matches. Mm -hmm. They gave him money. And then he used the money to buy mm -hmm. things for himself. He just doesn't see anything wrong with that. I mean, now, surely, what, what's wrong with this? What, what, because he has no moral compass of any kind. And one of the things, the subject you're learning about in this class about wealth and inequality and tax system and integrity has is a crucial component to it that, you know, you, you are not, the world is not about you. We are social creatures. We all have to live in a society. We're not 333 million people who just share real estate. That only works if you want to be an anarchist. And I don't have any interest in anarchy. You know, if you think the first movies were a good way to go, then that's for you. Um, so, all right. But any, unless somebody has a question on Donald. Yep, what's your name? Donald. Not Donald. All right, hold on. Man, Donald. Good. What's your name? Um, Andrew. I'm sorry? Andrew. Andrew. Yes. A N D R I K. Okay. Oh, and it's, uh, is that Dutch? Uh, it's Russian. It's right. I'm a white person. I'm Mexican. But oh, <laughs> oh no. I don't remember Trotsky got killed in Mexico. <laughs> okay. So um, I wrote this out because I want to make sure it's. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Good. That, that's a smart thing to do. So the belief in the belief of the American dream of pulling up like a bootstrap has been very like deep seated persistent practice by American people across all income levels. In fact, Steinbeck actually writes that in America the exploited the exploited proletariat so we sees themselves to temporarily embarrass the millions. So uh, this with this progressive tax, which is the estate tax, right? That affects only at a bit to pretty top of the income uh, tax tax brackets. So Similar to your earlier point about altruism, how does this complicate tax reform and effort? The estate tax? Yeah, like this. The okay. In, in my new book, uh, we will eliminate the estate tax. We'll replace it with capital gains of debt. Because the capital gains tax is a tax on the transfer of an asset, right? You own Apple, you cash it in, you buy Con Ed because it's a more conservative stock, and you have to pay a capital gains tax. Under my system, you don't have to pay the capital gains tax until either you die or you withdraw the money. You can sell Apple, buy Con Ed, no tax. But if you take money out of your account, then you have to pay tax. Well, when you die, you have to take money out of your account. And so all capital, and, and by the way, would you rather be taxed for your life or dead? Then. And so long as the, get right, and so long as your fortune is growing faster than the government's borrowing rate, I'm perfectly willing to wait until you're dead. Getting back. And look at the, at the growth rate of the fortunes of the billionaires. The government's borrowing rate is down here. Their growth rate is up above the ceiling. That's fine. But what happens now is they die and they don't pay taxes. So the estate tax combines already taxed what's called basis. So you go buy a stock for $100, jump up for price for $200. You have $100 of basis, $100 of gain. I get rid of tax and basis. And also, you can give all the money you want from your basis. Give all you want. When most people, when they die, they have this much basis and this much gain. Uh, I mean, Bill Gates started Microsoft with a $50,000 loan from his parents to the same gift. So his basis in Microsoft is zero. And in its peak, his holdings in it were over $100 billion. But he's been giving it away. So we're not going to any revenue out. So no capital gains of debt or a withdrawal from your account. That will encourage people to save more and will also encourage them to move me around. There's something called the lock-in effect. Oh, I don't know. I mean, if I sell my Apple and I buy Con Ed, I got to pay all oh, this tax here. I think I'll just hang on to it. Maybe a dumb thing to do. Um, we want to encourage savings. When poor people have something go wrong in their lives, they get arrested, maybe I'm on a bogus charge. Suddenly, taxpayers have to spend a lot of money. You get arrested, you're single. Your landlord throws all your stuff out in the street. 
taxpayers have to pay to pick it up. Uh, you get out of the joint, you know, you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't have proper legal representation. So when you get to trial and they let you go, you know, you've lost your home and whatever good you had, you got to start all over again. You got a family. The kids suddenly don't have uh, uh, medical insurance or something else. And we, we need to reform those things so we don't cost this money at the bottom. And at the same time, we want to encourage uh, more giving. And the estate tax was very important one time. So was the corporate income tax, but not anymore. Corporate income tax is crucial in poor countries, and like Argentina or South Africa, because they don't have a vibrant individual financial system. But in the U.S., where you know, I, I got on the bus in Manhattan today, and all I had to do was hold my phone up to the thing and pay. Um, <clears throat> we 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 have sophisticated financial means. We don't need we don't need to have corporate income taxes. We can tax the money that comes to you. That has some rules. Okay, who else? Your name is. Uh, my name is Justice. Hi, Justice. Justice. Like Justice. Yeah. Good name. Um, you so said we're not lawyers, were they? They are not lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so you, you spoke earlier about uh, Smith and the theory of health arguments on kind of the tendency of people to fetishize the rich or about towards the rich. Yeah. I, I think maybe fetishize is a good word for that. Yeah, so I think maybe my question would be like, does, does tax policy and tax reform need the change in the American psyche to stop fetishizing the rich? No. Or is it a change in the American psyche that maybe I decided to pay for the tax policy? Thank you. Justice, I started to say something about this earlier and I drifted off. Okay. Um, in ancient Athens, when you paid a big tax, like if Professor Pogge had to pay for the next festival, the festival of wine harvest, um, we would celebrate you. There would be a parade. We would throw garlands at you and say, thank you, you wonderful person. We would erect statues to you. But we, we ought to actually think about doing that with the biggest taxpayers. So we should say good things about them. Uh, we should honor them for what, what they're doing. Um, and, and create a culture that's like that instead of this cynical culture. Oh yeah, well, he only did that to get a tax break. I'm oh, sorry, you give away a billion dollars, that means you don't have the billion dollars anymore. <laughs> and yes, you may have saved 300 to 400 million dollars in taxes, but it's 300 to 400 million dollars in taxes you save. You don't have the money. You gave it up. It's not like you got the $300 million tax cut and kept the money. And people don't understand that. They really don't. Uh, most people don't have any understanding of finance. They don't know what profits are. They don't know what um, rates of return are. Um, you wouldn't believe how many small businesses just keep their business records in check. They don't know double entry bookkeeping or why it matters, which is there's no capitalism without insurance and without double entry bookkeeping. If you lived in ancient Rome, you wouldn't know capitalism because the idea that she said, oh, I have a, a big harvest this year, a great of, of, of olive oil, of olives or olive oil, I'm gonna buy Marisol, some Marisol land that she doesn't want anymore and make a bigger fortune. In fact, if you were a senator, you were limited to how much money you could make. It's a lot of money, but it was limited. And they, they weren't capitalists. They didn't think like capitalists. They didn't think to use the money, the earnings of your capital to buy more capital. Never occurred to Just as it doesn't occur to most ordinary Americans. So, yeah, we still have some moments to go here. There's one question behind you. Ah. Hey. Hi, Hi, My name is Jay. Hi, Jay. J A Y J A Y E J J A Y. Okay. Uh, my question is. In like the light of Greek democracy will become as the bastion of democracy and you know their altruism and the West is held up as you know the, the home of democracy. To what extent do you think that kind of altruism kind of got corrupted as far as you know, you know the tax or the top and holding on to the wealth and not really that? Well, I think what went on in ancient Greece was not altruistic or particularly laudable. It was an effort to cope with a problem in that society of resentment of abuses by the very wealthy. And remember that the rise of a Greek democracy came after uh, Draco 
from whom we get the word draconian. Uh, Draco wanted the punishment for murder to be death, and the punishment for stealing an apple to be death. And when he was asked why, he said, well, if you steal an apple, I think we should put you to death. The book, but that's not proportionate to murder people. Well, I know, but I can't think of anything worse than death. Uh, stolen, um, <laughs> canceled all debts. And the Old Testament, you know, has Jubilee. It's supposed to every 50 years, 49 years, to forgive all debts. No evidence has ever happened. So Solon, his friends found out they were going to cancel all debts. Some of the friends went out and borrowed a lot of money. And so they had to pay it back. And so there was there were problems in Greek society. There was also the, the, the invention of coins. And the invention of coins, people always had money, right? There, there are all sorts of accounting records we have from ancient Egypt, from Samaria. I used to teach the law in the ancient world. So, so of course. Um, the, but when they got coins, it, it set off a sort of societal panic. People who had four coins would dream about having 16 coins. And people worried about having their coins stolen. And they worried about the coins being debased. Because these were all new ideas and new things, as opposed to money being just on a tapping ledger in, in clay in Samaria. J, 50, D. You owe me 50. And we put this in clay and we put an envelope over it about what it was about. The, the, the envelope was broken, the, the, the document was corrupted. And you'd go buy a bunch of sheep and go up in the mountains and disappear, and you'd come back with a bunch of lambs, and you'd have enough money to pay me. And the 50 would include interest, usually 30% a year, by the way, very high interest rate. And so if you were a good shepherd and you kept the wolves and the lions away and you had a lot of little sheep, you'd come back and you'd have more money. And by the way, when you paid your debt, we'd break the envelope, we would moisten this clay tablet, and that's where we get the term, wipe your slate clean. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you've heard the phrase, the short end of the stick. Uh, in England, they don't have a lot of clay, but they got lots of trees. So records, financial records, were kept on hazel sticks, long thin hazel sticks. And you would owe the government so much money in the tax, and there was a regulation of the exchequer that I used to teach. I think it was from 1143. A thumb is this much money, and a finger is this much, and finally a little nick is so much, you know, a fraction of a penny farthing. And when time came to pay your tax, when you, when you made the record, you owe the tax. They split down the middle, you'd go home with your stick, government would keep this stick. You'd come in and say, okay, Jay, they go with this box of thousands of Jays, and they'd say, oh, here it is, yours. They'd match them up, you hand over the money, they break the stick. Well, somebody got the idea one day that it might be a little smarter if the government had a handle on this. Ah, uh, handle on this. So they only broke it part way down. You got the short end of the stick, the debt. The government got to keep the, the stock. That's what we call the stock. And eventually, the British had good enough paper, they could keep paper accounting records, and so this, these ones on wood. So they realized they didn't need all these sticks. And the liberals at the time said, well, let's give all these sticks to the poor. They can burn them in the fireplaces and keep their homes. And you know what the conservatives said? Government secrets! Invasion of privacy! We can't do that! We have to burn them! So the government started a fire in the basement of Parliament with these sticks, and it burned down Parliament to the ground. Yeah. Anyway, um, <coughs> did I answer your question reasonably well or not at all? I just like to follow up. To yeah. what, what extent do you think, you know, the, the Greek idea of democracy there is still alive? Oh. Well, the Greek idea of democracy is not our idea of democracy. Okay. But it is certainly the fundamental relation that we make the rules and we determine our debt. On that level, I think it's a great idea, but it's a proto idea. You know, there were proto corporations in the ancient world, there were proto bankruptcies, proto auditing, um, just like prototypes. And so the Greeks were the first in the Western world, you know, the, the Hutnathani people who lived here, they figured this out thousands of years earlier. 
and they had a democracy in which only women voted, only men ran for office, and the women could remove somebody like this. You misbehave, they had a way to get rid of you right now. You were abused. And that democracy had no effect on anything except that society. But the Greek idea, we could rule ourselves, we don't need a tyrant, a king. Uh, that's endured, and I think it's been very, very important. But don't, you know, it's not some golden, beautiful age of this and that. Compared to the rest of the world, it's paradise. Compared to today, a factor. Who else has that question? Hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Brian. Hi, Brian. I A N or Y? Hi. Yeah. Um, my question relates to taxes on capital versus taxes on income. Something that you believe taxes on labor. Uh, yeah, taxes on opportunities. Yeah. Um. So, like one passage I read in your reading that I thought was interesting is that the U.S. in the early 20th century actually, um. Had higher tax on capital than on labor. But, um, but that obviously isn't the case today, even though there is a significant tax but at the highest level. Um, billionaires pay more taxes than, um, uh, than other people. So I guess my question is do you think it's possible to return to a world where um, taxes on um, capital are less than, are, are more than taxes on labor? Because that's like one of the major well, we can do that. I mean, the fact is, we can create virtually any system we want. The Constitution places only three restrictions on taxation. Two of them are gone. And so the only thing that remains is you can't pass a tax law that says everybody who makes $100,000 pays X, except Brian, he has to pay X plus 10%. Um, we can do whatever we want, pretty much. I mean, Supreme Court would have a role in this, and depending on who's on the court, but as a, as a constitutional matter, uh, we can do anything. I mean, I, I laughingly, when I speak to groups of older Americans, I would say, listen, you know, we old people, we pay most of the taxes. But uh, we can shift that to young people. And I have the perfect method to do it. We'll turn the IRS into a profit center. I mean, think about all those gorgeous Hollywood stars and people like that. I think we should tax sex, the act of sex, and we should have uh, auditors bid to be the auditors. <laughs> they would raise a lot of money and shift the burden of taxes. I say the old, the old problems I was talking to, this, all the gray hairs would always laugh at the part of it. Um, I think a better solution is why do we distinguish between capital and labor? Well, only because we have corporate income tax. So there's a double level of taxation. Corporation makes a profit and pays corporate income tax, at least in theory. And then pays you a dividend, and you pay taxes on the dividend. So the argument is this is unfair. I mean, tax twice. Okay, so let's replace the corporate income tax with a different system, which is what my book will propose. And now you're indifferent. A dollar is a dollar is a dollar. In the same way, there's an old saying in the tax world that um, you should tax all chips alike potato chips, chocolate chips, buffalo chips, micro chips. Tax them all equally. So I think that the solution to this, that was a very smart solution back then. Remember, in the early 20th century, um, people didn't have bank accounts. They didn't get paid like we My father worked on Boulder Dam or your Republican Boulder Dam, and he was a timekeeper, which meant he kept a record of how many hours you worked. And then when Saturday came, you stood in line and you came up and said, I'm Brian Smith, and he would get, pick up a little envelope that had Build some coins in it and hand you your pet. Well, you know, we now have digital currency. We don't need any of that stuff anymore. One day a lot of jobs are timekeepers, by the way. Um, so I, I, I think there are better solutions than going back to, to taxing capital at a higher rate than labor. And I want to have more, I want to have capital, by the way. In, in the ancient world, if you and a sewer borrowed money and couldn't pay it back, you with men who did the borrowing in most cases. You, your wife, your concubine, your children could be forced into slavery. This is not the slavery of the new world, which is a horrible institution. This is a slavery system where slaves had rights. You couldn't rape and murder your slaves as you could in America and South America. Uh, and you could get out of slavery. It wasn't a hereditary condition. And in the case of bankruptcy, proto-bankruptcy law, 
and federal banking regulations, you could only take the person and their family and as slaves for three years. That's a banking regulation. I'm not going to loan you any more money than the net value after feeding and housing and clothing you for three years of your family. The banking regulations, the bankruptcy regulations, it is a proto form of the modern world because people were figuring these things out. Remember, they didn't have all the distractions we did. They didn't have computer games. They didn't have a lot of time to sit around and think. At least the ones who were smart enough to think. Who else? Who hasn't asked the question? <coughs> Sir, what's your name? Ishan. Ishan. I S H A N? Uh, w yeah. I S H A N. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can answer this quick. Um, I recently read an article that someone called Barris who donated 1.6 billion to the new controller and profit. Right. Um, and I found that really interest, interesting, particularly because he donated shares of cash to so take taxes. So he gave the company. He just gave the company. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so I just wondered, you know, what his thoughts were on um, defasciation by the point, point of view of the new Well, okay. No, I, I got this. I got this. So there's a very wealthy 90 year old billionaire who gave this company away to uh, an entity controlled by a guy named Leonard Leo, who is the guy, the, the spark plug of the Federalist Society, put all these very right wing judges on the bench. And his lawyers came up with the device for him to give the company away so he would there'd be no capital gains taxes, but he got no tax deduction either for the company because it's a 501c4, not a 501c3. Um, but if you're 90 years old, what do you need $1.6 billion for? I mean, he's got plenty of other money. There's nothing useful here. He's looking at the end of his life. Um, if you're my age and haven't already written a couple of wills, you know, and you've got money, you're being irresponsible. The problem here is that now you have this unaccountable organization that doesn't have to disclose a lot of things about what it's doing with the money that has this fund. And they can spend 5% forever. That's $80 million a year without going any of the donors. And uh, unaccountable anything is bad. Unaccountable anything is bad. We all need to be held to account. Whether it's you know um, uh, uh, paying your taxes, properly filing your government form, or as uh, my daughters, I have five daughters and three sons, like to point out, the boys not putting the toilet seat down. Okay. They came up with interesting methods to make sure they were held accountable. Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 my concern is uncountable money, not so much that somebody avoided paying the tax. But I also think that's a provision law we should look at. There are more than 25 different kinds of 501c organizations. Only 501c3s are charities. In the uh, uh, first legal, I wrote about a guy who had an insurance company that took in about $64,000 a year of premium, that is, buckets, hardly a company. And he got a $500 million tax free gain. And I will say to his credit that when uh, one year I called Mr. Kellogg and they were talking to me, the assistant took my call. I said, I can't find a tax form. You failed to file it. They said, no, 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 no. We undid, we stopped doing that transaction. But Mr. Kellogg told me to tell you he was very impressed that you were able to figure this out. <laughs> and I thought, well, whatever else, he's a classy guy. But he got, he got away with $500 million gain because he shouldn't. The tax law is full of this kind of nonsense. I call it filigree. The U.S. government's version of our tax code is 3,900 pages, the most recent version that I have. Uh, my version will be 200. This, no, this, is, this is just bought favors. You know, uh, one of the turkey, one of the chicken companies in America has a tax favor the other companies don't have. You know, we, it's nonsense. We have to stop all this. Money is money. I don't care how you make your money. I care how much you make. And I also don't care how many kids you have. If we're going to subsidize families instead of saying you get a tax deduction, no, we're going to write your check. And I would write checks to everybody. I would write a check to Bill Gates. If we say you can get $100 a month for having a kid, then it costs us that much. You, you know, if you want to cut out Bill Gates, you have to have those old complex mechanisms. It's not worth it. Just, he gets the check too. And the only difference being you can choose not to get the money. Trust me, Donald Trump will collect everything. 
<laughs> on that happy note, I think you have to close. Say it again. On that happy note, we have to close. Ah, it's five yeah. ten. So thank you very much. And a few last bits of the dinner with yeah. you, and we'll. Well, thank you all for very good questions. I, I, I was very impressed, and I, I really am impressed with the gentleman. Uh, is it Ant, um, Justin Alex? Yeah. Very well done report. Just keep in mind the one thing I said to you at the beginning of this. We created this system. It didn't just happen. And we can create a different system. And we can still create a system that encourages people to invest and to make money and to build companies, but that doesn't result in these non totally non-utilitarian accretions of wealth, well, we have a lot of poverty. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.